Assuming that we went with scenario number one, trading for signing, signing. This is how I personally would build out the 2025 opening day lineup. The Mariners will break their drought and win the AL West. I think they are positioned phenomenally compared to the rest of the teams. The Seattle Mariners once again in 2024 missed the playoffs. They were eliminated in game 160 this season, just two years after breaking their 21 year playoff drought. They finished 85 and 77, a 52.5% winning percentage, and that magic number of 54% would have gotten them into the playoffs. And they are now the first team since the 1995 Angels to hold a 10 game divisional lead and still miss the playoffs. The hot stove has been fired up and we are about a month away from the MLB winter meetings in which there should be a lot of activity. So today we're gonna get into the Mariners 2024-25 offseason preview. Buckle up and grab a coffee because we're going to get into it today. We're going to go through the 2024 season recap, talk about some of the positives, some of the negatives. We're going to get into the departures of the team, the current depth chart, the financial overview, the offseason needs for the Mariners, the free agents that are going to be out there on the market that might make sense. We're going to cover a couple of trade options. We'll then go into the prospects to look for in this year and next, and then my 2025 opening day lineup. And before we get into this, if you'd like to support myself and what I'm doing in the Couch GM, I myself am actually a mortgage broker full time in the Pacific Northwest. I'm currently licensed in Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and California. So if you or someone you know is thinking of buying, selling, or refinancing a property anywhere in those states, make sure to reach out to myself. I'll have my contact information in the description of this video if you'd like to reach out and connect. It's my goal to help as many Mariner fans as possible get into the home of their dreams, so don't hesitate to reach out. Starting off with some positives from the 2024 season, Cal Raleigh and Dylan Moore both won gold gloves. Cal Raleigh took home the platinum glove. Dylan Moore became the first Mariners player to win a gold glove for the utility position. He's one of those guys that isn't often in the spotlight, but he is the Swiss Army knife of the Seattle Mariners. He plays every position, gives this team so much flexibility on the defensive side of the ball, and since he joined the team in 2019, he's been right at a league average bat he has a 99 OPS plus and then Cal Raleigh the big dumper all of us Seattle Mariner fans knew that this guy has been the best catcher in baseball since he entered the league all of the bias within media had written Cal off year in and year out even coming into this year some of the polls didn't even have him as a top 10 catcher well Cal Raleigh won the gold glove for catcher in the American League he also won the platinum glove which means the best defender in the entire American League on top of this, he is currently one of the Silver Slugger finalists for the catcher position, and he is going to win that award as well. What Cal does at the plate, what he does defensively throwing out runners, pitch framing, calling a game with the best starting rotation of baseball, Cal is no doubt the best catcher in the game. John Stanton, please back up the Brinks truck, give Cal Raleigh whatever he wants, and dump some cash on this guy. Speaking of Cal Raleigh and his management of that pitching staff, the starting rotation was the best in franchise history, no doubt about it. The Mariners rotation led the majors in ERA, set a franchise record for lowest starting pitcher ERA in a season, and they also led all of baseball in opponent batting average, whip, strikeout to walk ratio, fewest walks per nine innings, fewest hits per nine innings, opponent on base percentage, opponent OPS, and quality starts. The 92 quality starts were fourth most in a season in franchise history. And when comparing this rotation to rotations in the past, you have to consider that back in the day, guys were allowed to go longer, go deeper into games. So although this rotation might not have the same amount of innings logged or as high of a wins above replacement as some of the prior rotations, looking at it from a stuff to stuff basis, one through five, really one through six, this is certainly the best rotation the Mariners have ever had. And this rotation this year was led by Logan Gilbert. He posted a 3.23 ERA, 220 strikeouts to 37 walks in 33 starts. He made his first all-star game. He led the majors in innings pitched and whip. He became the first pitcher in Mariners history to lead MLB in innings pitched over a season, as well as the first Seattle pitcher to lead baseball and whip. His 22 quality starts were tied for second most in the majors. And he became the first pitcher to lead the majors in innings pitch and whip since Justin Verlander back in 2019. Then there's George Kirby. George Kirby once again led the majors in strikeout to walk ratio at 7.78. This was his second year in a row doing so. He also led the majors in fewest walks per nine innings with just 1.1. And he led both of these categories for the second year in a row, becoming the first player since Cliff Lee back in 2012. The command that Kirby has along with his power stuff, I don't know if we've seen it in baseball before. And the most improved guy in the rotation this year was Bryce Miller. Bryce Miller was absolutely insane in his sophomore campaign. He went 12-8 and with a 2.94 ERA, 171 strikeouts to 45 walks, and 31 starts. Again, he had a 2.94 ERA and also a 0.976 whip. 
He became the second pitcher in Mariners history with a sub-3 ERA and a sub-1 whip in a qualified season. The other guy to do that was pretty good for the Mariners. That was Felix Hernandez back in 2014. And that all sounds great, but what if I told you that Bryce Miller was actually Corbin Burns? This is a tweet from Luke Arkins comparing Bryce Miller and Corbin Burns side by side. They were essentially the same pitcher. Corbin Burns had one extra start, but Bryce Miller had a better strikeout rate than Corbin Burns. And they had right around the same walk rate. And Bryce logged 180 and a third innings in his second year. That addition of the splitter made a huge difference for him this year. After this video, go check out my video talking about Bryce Miller's splitter and how that came to be. And it did not just end with Bryce. It was Bryce and Brian Wu. The Mariners duo and Bryce Miller and Brian Wu became the fourth duo in MLB history to each have a sub-3 ERA and a sub-1 whip within their first two career seasons with a minimum 100 innings pitched. They joined Dutch Leonard and Ernie Shore from the 1914 Boston Red Sox, Walter Johnson and Bill Burns from the 1908 Washington Senators, and Henry Boyle and Perry Worden for the 1884 St. Louis Maroons. Again, to clarify, there has been no other combo since 1914 to have a sub-3 ERA and a sub-1 whip within their first two career seasons than for Bryce Miller and Brian Wu. And these are the Mariners' four and five guys. This rotation is historic. Another positive from the 2024 season ended up being the coaching change that occurred on August 23rd when Dan Wilson was hired as the manager and Edgar Martinez was hired as the hitting coach. Over the final 34 games of their season, they were on a 100-win pace, going 7-2-2 two two over the final 11 series. And over the last 23 games of the season, Seattle's offense was averaging 5.48 runs per game, which was third in baseball, a 273 batting average, which was second in baseball, a 355 on base percentage, which was second in baseball, a 449 slug, which was third, and an 804 OPS, which is second in all of baseball. Edgar Martinez and his simplistic approach at the plate helped the Mariners lock it in and go from one of the worst offenses in all of baseball in all of baseball history with their strikeout rate to one of the best offensive producing teams in the league this year. The numbers on the left side are from opening day through August 31st, and then on the right side are from September 1st through the end of the season, those final 23 games. And if you'd like to take a second to pause real quick, this is the complete stats of the starting rotation for 2024. This is one through six. Emerson Hancock also played a massive role for the Mariners. He came in whenever Brian Wu was on the injured list, filling in those innings. Brian Wu ended up going 121 in a third innings pitch this year. Emerson Hancock stepped up and pitched 60 and two thirds innings. So those two guys combined had over 180 innings pitched, which was essentially the baseline for the remainder of the rotation. And the fact that Luis Castillo was fourth out of the starting rotation in total innings pitched, he was also last out of those top five guys in ERA and whip. That tells you how big of a step up this entire rotation has taken. And all of those top five guys in the rotation had below a four ERA. They all had below a 1.2 whip, and there was three guys with a sub-1 whip. And again, there was two guys in that rotation with a sub-3 ERA. Then here we have the bullpen as a whole. Andres Munoz was his typical self. He had a 2.12 ERA, which is a 173 ERA+. plus. He had a sub-1 whip, approaching a 12 strikeouts per 9 innings, and he tallied 22 saves on the year. Trent Thornton played a huge part in the bullpen this year. He logged the most innings out of the bullpen with 72 and a third innings pitched. Austin Both came in second with 61 total innings pitched. Ryan Stanek logged a lot of innings before he was traded to the Mets. Taylor Saucedo and Colin Snyder were also big parts of the bullpen. And Troy Taylor coming in late in the year looked like he has some fantastic stuff. As you'll see in the preview, the bullpen essentially will be the same heading into next year. And then here is the Mariners offense as a whole. I won't go too deep into this, but essentially the Mariners were averaging somewhere around a 220 or below batting average. And a majority of the offensive starters were below a league average bat, a sub 100 OPS plus. So now who are the departures for the Seattle Mariners this coming year? First off, the Mariners declined Jorge Polanco's $12 million club option. He seemed to be a great pickup last offseason, but didn't pan out once again. It turns out that he was dealing with an injury, which he had surgery on this offseason. I was on the train of picking up his club option just to maximize the potential of this team. But in the same line, I understand why they aren't wanting to spend the $12 million, especially when there's no definitive timeline on when exactly he'll be back. The assumption is before spring training next year, though. Jimmy Garcia, relief pitcher that was acquired at the deadline last year, is also heading to free agency. Justin Turner, first base slash DH, that veteran in the clubhouse that also really helped out with their approach at the plate in the second half, he is also heading to free agency. There is certainly a chance that they bring him back on a one-year deal, especially to help out in the clubhouse with the younger guy's approach at the plate. And then Luis Arias, an infielder that was acquired also last offseason from the Red Sox, was released. So now the current depth chart for the Mariners. Again, this is the starting rotation right here. No nothing is changing. 
This is their greatest strength on their roster, and this needs to stay intact. And as Jared Depoto mentioned in his media availability at the end of the year, it's essentially plan Z to trade one of these guys in order to amplify their offense next year. Here is the depth chart for the bullpen next year. It's going to be a lot in the same. Hopefully we'll see a healthy Gregory Santos. Matt Brash is going to be back to full strength. That will be massive. A back end of Gregory Santos, Matt Brash, and Andres Munoz will again have the potential to be one of the best bullpens in baseball. Working to the position players, we now have Cal Raleigh and Mitch Garver as the two catchers currently at first base. Right now, it's Luke Rayley as the first baseman. Second base, as of right now, Dylan Moore is starting. At third base, again, you have Josh Rojas. Dylan Moore really fills in wherever you need him. And at shortstop, you have J.B. Crawford. He's got another two years on his contract. We'll have to see what their plans are. And if they decide to have a stopgap between J.B. Crawford and Colt Emerson, or if Colt Emerson's going to be getting the call to the show at about 21 years old. As for the outfield, you're going to have one of the most dynamic, high-ceiling outfields in all of baseball. You've got Randy Rosarena in left field. you got Julio Rodriguez in center field. Victor Robles, the Robles resurgence in right field. You also have Mitch Hanniger, who is currently in depth of right field. You got Luke Rayleigh, who could play every position. But the power and speed combos that all three of these starters, along with Luke Rayleigh, bring to the clubhouse and to the plate is again one of the highest ceilings in all of baseball for an outfield. As for designated hitter, right now it's going to be Mitch Garber as the primary DH. You got Mitch Hanniger right there and you also got Julio if you need a day off in the outfield and you just want him to hit. Now getting into the Mariners' financials, they ended the 2024 season spending 156, right at $157 million in cash total, which was 17th in the league, 17 out of 30 teams. Their adjusted total payroll was $148 million. And heading into 2025, currently their payroll allocations are at $97 million. However, their projected total allocations after arbitration is currently set at about $148.5 million, right where they ended last season. And this is after subtracting Jorge Polanco's contract. As you can see, the projected arbitration payouts is somewhere in the range of 46 to $47 million. Now, here are all of the contracts that are currently on the Mariners' books. The most expensive one heading into next year is Luis Castillo. He's getting paid $24.15 million. Julio Rodriguez takes another bump up this year. He's getting paid just shy of $20 million. Mitch Hanniger opted into his player option for $17.5 million. Mitch Garver is getting paid twelve and a half. million. And then the purple numbers are the projected arbitration estimates. So Randy Rosa is going to take a big jump up in arbitration. He's projected to get $11.5 million. Logan Gilbert's taking a big jump up to 8.3. You also have Josh Rojas, Cal Raleigh, George Kirby, Austin Both, JT Chargua, and Matt Brash that are part of arbitration. JP Crawford, Victor Robles, Dylan Moore, and Andres Munoz are already locked into a contract. And then here are all the guys that are also arbitration eligible or pre-arbitration. The league minimum for 2025 looks to be right at $800,000. All right, so what are the Mariners offseason needs for this year. They need a short to midterm solution at second base to be a stopgap until Cole Young comes up and starts producing as an everyday big leaguer. As we all know, second base has been the biggest black hole for the Mariners offensively since Robinson Cano was shipped to the Mets in the winter of 2018. Their second biggest need is going to be a veteran first baseman. Right now, they have Luke Rayleigh playing first base every day. He was primarily an outfielder. He was taking reps at first base last year and logged some innings there. But you need a guy at first base that's going to be able to log pretty much everyday reps, and they can do a 50-50 share if needed. And then looking at third base or second base, one of those positions is going to be a platoon tune of Josh Rojas and Dylan Moore. They'll have to decide which position they want to spend the money on, but they have to go out and acquire talent at one of those positions. The remaining position can be filled out by Josh Rojas and Dylan Moore. And when I am building the roster out, I'm going to be building a lineup built around batting average, on-base percentage, and speed. T-Mobile Park is not a home run friendly ballpark. It's not a spot where big power hitters come into here and have great success. It's not a ballpark where the ball flies off the bat, especially earlier in the year. We've gone about the roster construction, aiming for walks and home runs. Now it's time to build a team that's fit for this ballpark, focused on contact, batting average, on base, speed, stealing bases, bunting guys over, playing small ball, moving guys over, and crossing home plate. And as we get into it, here's some insight from Adam Jude of the Seattle Times talking about the Mariners offseason. He states, as things stand here early in the offseason, Luke Rayleigh is a safe bet to be the Mariners opening day first baseman next season. They said the Mariners are comfortable with the defensive improvements that Rayleigh, an outfielder for the vast majority of his career, made at first base this past season, and they view the left-handed hitting slugger as a viable option as half of a first base platoon going into 2025. The front office, though, is open to adding another first baseman via trade or free agency. The Mariners are in the market for two impactful infielders this offseason, said Jerry DePoto. 
The Mariners are not expected to be engaged with the top of the market free agents like longtime Astros third baseman Alex Bregman, and they have been linked to more modest upgrades such as second baseman Haesong Kim, who will reportedly be posted this winter by his KBO team. And also something to keep in mind, especially when talking about free agent bats, is that the largest contract and the most amount of years that Jared Poto has signed a free agent bat to in his tenure was Mitch Garver last offseason when he was signed to a two-year $24 million contract. No other free agent bat in the DePoto era has been signed to a longer or larger contract than Mitch Garver's contract. So just keep that in mind. So I'm going to say that the budget heading into opening day 2025 is going to be $180 million. $180 million would put the Mariners somewhere in the top 16 of baseball. It would jump them up just really one to two spots. And this would give us an additional 20 to $30 million for next year to upgrade the roster. So getting into the free agents, again, this is Alex Bregman. His market value is a four-year contract at $30 million apiece. Just his bat in the Mariners lineup would be awesome. I personally do not see him in a Mariners uniform, especially being in an Astros uniform his entire career, being a part of that 2017 Astros team. I don't see it happening, but of course, he is one of the top free agent bats this offseason. Another bat that the Mariners will not go after is going to be Pete Alonso. He's expected to get a six-year, 20 $9 million per year contract. He's a guy that a lot of Mariners fans want and his power very well would play at T-Mobile Park, that's for sure. But again, he's going to be too pricey for the Mariners. This is not going to be on the table. Another name that comes up often in free agency is the former shortstop for the Milwaukee Brewers and Wooly Adamas. He is expected to get a six-year $152 million contract, which is averaging about 25 plus per year. Again, I don't think the Mariners will go out and do this. He was in the top 10th percentile in total batting run value. And he's a guy that last year hit 30 32 home runs, stole 21 bags, had over a 250 batting average, over a 330 on base, and was approaching an 800 OPS. I certainly am open to options in which the Mariners decide to move on from J.B. Crawford. If they were to go that route, then it would make sense to bring in Wooly Adamas. But beyond that, I don't think they're going to commit to this big of an upgrade in the infield. Another big name that Mariners fans are hoping for is Christian Walker. His expected market value is in the range of three years for $66 million. That would be at an average of 22 per year. This guy certainly is also a bopper. He's got a ton of power. And also people talk about his ability at first base. He had one of the best ranges in all of baseball. And when he hits the ball, he hits it hard. He also had over a 250 batting average. He had over an 800 OPS. And he's a guy that's going to hit 25 to 30 plus home runs per year. Another guy that's been floated around is Anthony Santander. He's expected to get a five-year, $88 million contract. He's a switch hitting outfielder that could also be a DH. He's been a consistent guy. And last year for the Orioles, he hit 40 four home runs. Objectively, of course, putting Anthony Santander in the middle of your lineup would be a huge add. I just don't really see the fit with the Mariners outfield being complete. Really, the only position for him is going to be at the DH. So unless the Mariners were to trade Mitch Garber, bring in Anthony Santander at DH, I don't see as much of the fit as some people do. Then looking at upgrades for second base, you got Hassan Kim, who is now a free agent. He was with the Padres since he came over from the KBO. He's expected to get a four-year, $49 million contract, which is an average of $12 million per year. This is a guy with a solid contact ability. He does not chase often. He doesn't whiff often. He has a solid walk rate, and he doesn't strike out much. He also is known as being a solid defender at second base and shortstop. You could really put him at third base, shortstop, second base, anywhere in the infield, and he could play for you. He's also got the speed. He had 38 stolen bases in 2023, 22 stolen bases last year. But I think the Mariners will go after another guy in the KBO. Glaber Torres is another name being floated around at second base. Please, for the love of God, please do not go get Glaber Torres. He's expected to get a three-year, $21 million contract, an average of, of about seven per year. His production increased in 2023, in which he had a 273 batting average. But there were multiple times where he was benched by Aaron Boone for not running out balls, for being lackadaisical in the field. You could see that his fielding run value and his base running run value are one of the lowest in baseball. This is not the profile at all that I would want in the Mariners roster. Which brings us to a guy that I think would be an awesome fit for the Mariners, and that's Haesong Kim. Haesong Kim will be heading into his age 26 season. He is coming over from the KBO. You look at his stats the past three years, his, he's been a 320 plus average hitter. He's had an on-base percentage in the range of 370 to 400. The past four years, he's stolen 46, 34, 25, and 30 bases. He is a three-time Gold Glove winner at second base in the KBO, and he's a guy that you could potentially move around the infield as well, although his main position is going to be second base. He is projected on the free market to be getting somewhere in the range of a two- to three-year deal at about $8 million per year. 
Which brings us to another free agent, which is Yohan Moncada. This is a former top prospect for the Red Sox and for the White Sox. He has had injuries throughout the past few years, and because of those reasons, and the fact that the White Sox just paid him $5 million when they declined their club option, means that Yohan Moncada would be available for a cheap deal. He's projected to get a one-year, $1.5 million contract as a prove-it deal. When he's fully healthy, he's a switch-hitting third baseman at 29, 30 years old that has the potential to be a 260 and above hitter. He's got 20-plus home run pop, and he's got one of the prettiest swings from the left side of the plate. Which brings us to solution number one, which is trade for Yandy Diaz. You could debate in the comments below on what it would take to bring in Yandy Diaz, but based on what I looked up online, some combination of a Michael Arroyo, Cade Marlowe, and a Jimmy Joyce. Michael Arroyo is a 19-year-old shortstop currently in high A. Cade Marlowe is an outfielder that has been playing in AAA. We just don't quite have the opportunity for Cade. And then Jimmy Joyce is a starting pitching prospect in AA. We'll get into Yandy Diaz in a second, but then secondly, I would sign Hai Song Kim to a three-year, $24 million contract, which is an average of $8 million per year. Then sign Yohan Mankata to a two-year, $4 million contract, which is an average of $2 million per year. And then finally, DFA Mitch Haniger to free up for a roster spot. The totals of these moves for 2025 would add about $20 million, bringing the total payroll up to above $170 million. This solution keeps the starting rotation completely intact. Spend a little more money, keep the starting rotation intact. So first off, the Yandi Diaz trade for the Mariners would have a net increase in payroll of $9.2 million. He is expected to make $10 million in 2025. There's also a club option for 2026, which would be $12 million. You subtract out Cade Marlowe's league minimum, as well as Jimmy Joyce and Michael Arroyo's minor league contracts. That gets you to a net increase of 2025 of about $9.2 million. So who is Yandi Diaz? Well, he's essentially the best profile of a first baseman you could potentially go out and get if you're the Seattle Mariners. I personally am not seeking power at this point. I'm seeking contact ability, getting on base, and that's exactly what this guy does. Throughout his eight seasons in the big leagues, he's averaging right at a 290 batting average, a 373 on base. And in 2022 and 23, he had over a 400 on base percentage. His 2023 was ridiculous. He had a 932 OPS, a 330 batting average. I'm really surprised he doesn't hit more home runs. He's 6'2", 215. The guy's absolutely freaking yoked. But he's a contact hitter that focuses on getting on base and making hard contact. He is top 20 in average exit velocity in the league, but he only has a 5 degree average launch angle which is his reason for not having more home runs. This guy hits the ball extremely hard on a line, not popping the ball up, which is exactly what you need in this lineup. And let's just get the band back in town. Yandy Diaz and Randy Rosarena, they were both on the Rays. Let's get them back on the same team. And this lineup that we can build with getting Yandy Diaz alone is going to be a lot of fun. Part two of this solution is going to be signing Haisong Kim to a three-year $24 million contract, which looking around, that is about what industry experts expect out of a contract with him. And then again, sign Yohan Moncada. These two signings would add $10 million for 2025. As we already discussed, Hai Song Kim is a high batting average, a great defender, a guy with speed, and a guy hitting from the left side of the plate. He adds something different to your lineup. I would mention that I am cautiously optimistic about this signing. The reason is that Ha Song Kim had come over from the KBO, joined the Padres, and his prior two seasons in the KBO before coming to the major leagues, he also was hitting above 300 and had over a 380 on base percentage. But his first year in the majors, he finished with just above a 200 batting average and a 270 on base. And in his remaining time in the major leagues, he's been floating around the 230 to 250 batting average, 320 to 350 on base percentage. Although their profiles are certainly different, Ha Song Kim has more power than Hai Song Kim. But again, cautiously optimistic about signing Hai Song Kim and what he can bring to this team. On what Hai Song Kim brings to the table, John Morosi stated that he's someone that has occasional power. He can handle velocity and would play a very solid second base. And we know what a difficult position that's been for the Mariners to have some stability. Another positive, Morosi mentioned that Kim, who swings left-handed and will be 26 next season, would be a nice fit for the Mariners when it comes to their budget. He said he's not going to be, I don't think, a very expensive player. I think a two-year contract in the range of maybe six to eight million per year would be doable for him. And I think that he would do well with that type of contract with the Mariners. And again, some of my reasoning for getting Yohan Moncada is that he is a prime candidate for another change of scenery. We saw what a change of scenery did for Victor Robas last year. He was a former top prospect for the Nationals. He had underperformed his entire career, came to Seattle, made a couple changes. The weight was taken off of his shoulders. He was able to just be himself and he turned into an absolute superstar. The same very well might be true for Yohan Moncada. He was a top prospect back in 2016 for the Red Sox. He was a part of the trade that sent Chris Sale from the White Sox to the Red Sox. And he was one of the big hopes for the White Sox after that point. 
He has now spent eight seasons with the White Sox, and you could see his ceiling in 2019, in which he hit 315 with a 367 on base. He had over a 900 OPS. He hit 25 home runs from both sides of the plate. And also in 2021, in 144 games, he hit 263 with a 787 OPS. But the past couple years, he's dealt with injuries. He played in just 104 games in 2022, 92 games in 2023, and just 12 games last year. From the articles that I've read, Yohan Moncada is now back to full health. The White Sox have moved on from him, and he is looking forward to a new opportunity somewhere. And with the Mariners not wanting to spend money, taking a flyer on a guy like Yohan Moncada, combine him in some type of platoon with Josh Rojas and Dylan Moore at third base. Worst case scenario is you spend $4 million on a flyer that doesn't work out. Best case is you get a league average or better switch hitting third baseman, still with some solid upside. Now solution number two, I hope that the Mariners do not do this, but this is just another scenario that I threw out there to think of what if the Mariners did trade one of the starting pitchers. So number one is trading Logan Gilbert to the Phillies for third baseman Alec Bohm, and also their number two overall prospect, starting pitcher Andrew Painter. Logan Gilbert has a ton of value, and this is an example of what it might take to actually get Logan Gilbert. This trade would also be assuming that Logan Gilbert were to sign an extension immediately with the Phillies. Number two, this scenario again would be to, to sign Haesong Kim to a three-year $24 million contract. In this scenario, since we're not going to be trading for Yandy Diaz, we're going to sign Justin Turner to a one-year $7 million contract. And since there's now a hole in the starting rotation, we're also going to try to sign Sean Manaya to a two-year $35 million contract. In this scenario, we would then DFA Hannah and also Sam Haggerty to free up some space on the 40-man roster. All of these moves would add about $32 million for the 2025 season, bringing the total payroll up to a little above $180 million. So first off, the trade of Logan Gilbert for Alec Bohm and Andrew Painter. Logan Gilbert and Alec Bohm's contracts are essentially a wash. Logan Gilbert is projected to get $8.3 million. Alec Bohm is projected to get $8.1 million. Logan Gilbert does have one more year of control than Alec Bohm. Bohm would become a free agent after the 2026 season. But this is a guy that the Mariners could look to extend as well and be a, more of a long-term solution at third base. Andrew Painter is a 6'7 stud, and he could help fill out that starting rotation after Sean Manaya's contract is up. Sean Manaya had a big bounce back here last year for the Mets, and coming from the left side of the bump, he brings something different to your rotation. And factor in the Mariners pitching lab, and Sean Manaya could very well take that next step up and be a solid starting pitcher for the next couple years. You also need to factor in some of the prospects that are going to be coming up. First off, we mentioned that Cole Young is going to be coming up at second base, likely this year. I think by the all-star break of this season, you'll see Cole Young getting some reps. We'll see what they do at second base, but if they do have Haesong Kim playing second base, you could have Cole Young off the bench. You can maybe move High Song to third base, Cole Young to third base. I'm also curious to see how soon we'll see Harry Ford. If Mitch Garver ends up struggling mightily again this year at the plate, you've got Harry Ford right there that could come up and produce at the plate. He could also be a backup to Cal Raleigh. He could also help out at DH as well. You also have top starting pitching prospects, Logan Evans and Michael Morales, that we could see at some point this year. Let's hope the rotation stays healthy and that we don't have to end up seeing these guys. But those are a couple names to look for, and they could help with production this year. Then you got Colt Emerson at shortstop, who probably is going to see some time coming in 2026. Colt Emerson is the future for the Mariners at shortstop, and we very well could see him debut as a 21-year-old in 2026. You also then have Lazaro Montez, who is a outfielder slash DH, who we very well could see in 2026. He is a massive dude that has huge power potential as well as bat-to-ball skills. So, assuming that we went with scenario number one, trading for Yandy Diaz, signing Haesong Kim, signing Yohan Moncada, this is how I personally would build out the 2025 opening day lineup. You got Haesong Kim as a lefty batting leadoff at second base. He's got that high High contact and speed ability. Julio Rodriguez batting two. He's got that power and speed combo. You got Randy Rosarena in left field batting third with power and speed again. You got Yandy Diaz with an insane contact and power ability. Imagine Haesong Kim gets on base. Steals second base, Julio Rodriguez hits a gapper, Randy Rosarena hits a sharp single, and then you got Yandy Diaz, one of the highest contact ability guys, to keep the lineup moving. You then got the dumper to clean up anything that's left on the bases. Then starting again with Victor Robles as another big contact and speed combo. You got Yohan Mancada as a switch hitter batting seven, Mitch Garver at DH with the power ability, and then you got J.B. Crawford rounding it out in the ninth spot. Let's hope that J.B. Crawford can have another bounce back year. I'd like to see him just have a higher on-base percentage at least. As for the rotation, you would have Logan Gilbert as your opening day starter. You got George Kirby slotted two. Luis Castillo, I would bump down to the three spot. You then got Bryce Miller at the four and Brian Wu at the five. You got Emerson Hancock, Logan Evans, Michael Morales, all there as potential fill-ins if you end up needing some depth there. Then for the bullpen, you got Andres Munoz closing out games. You got Matt Brash, Gregory Santos, Gabe Spire as setup guys. 
We should see Jackson Coar at some point this year. He's been recovering from Tommy John. You also have Taylor Salcedo, Trent Thornton, Troy Taylor, and Colin Snyder. On the bench, you would have Josh Rojas, who could fill in really in any infield position. You got Dylan Moore, who's the super utility guy. You got Luke Rayley at depth for the outfield and first base. You also have Leo Rivas, who can fill in in the infield. You could also add Cole Young, Harry Ford, Ryan Bliss, Tyler Locklear, Dominic Canzone. The list goes on of guys that could come up and fill in spots when needed. So my predictions for the 2025 Mariners are that the Mariners will break their drought and win the AL West. I think they are positioned phenomenally compared to the rest of the teams. The Astros, you got Alex Bregman, who's probably gonna, gonna head elsewhere. They're gonna be taking a step back, I hope. You got the Rangers, which are gonna continue to be dangerous. The A's looked a lot better this year. They've got some studs on their team, but they're gonna be going through some weird situations and playing in Sacramento. And then you also have the Angels, who probably will be a non-factor again this year. This is the time for the Mariners to step up and take the division. I'm also gonna predict that Bryce Miller is gonna be top five in Cy Young this year. He was a top 10 Cy Young guy in his sophomore campaign this year, thanks largely to his splitter, and I think he's gonna take that next step this coming year. And he's gonna be a top five Cy Young guy, probably putting up close to 200 innings. I'm gonna predict that Julio has a big year this coming year. I think Julio is going to go 35-35, 35 home runs, 35 stolen bases. And I'm going to say that Andres Munoz is going to be the most valuable relief pitcher in all of baseball this year. He's been the best guy for the Mariners year in and year out. I think this next year he's going to overtake Emmanuel Class A and some of these other top guys, make another all-star game, and become the most valuable relief pitcher in baseball. If you made it this far, thank you so much for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe, and please let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I know all of us couch GMs have different ideas of what we like the Mariners roster to look like, so let me know your thoughts on what I proposed, what you would change, and what your predictions for the 2025 Mariners will be. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.